Uh, let me also thank uh, the earlier presenters. Uh, so I am very glad I can stand on the shoulders of all the presentations which have been given this morning. I think they give kind of uh, excellent uh, introduction also to, um, to explaining you now what uh, the Clarion technical infrastructure looks like and what we're basically trying to provide uh, in terms of services, data and tools. Okay, um, well you've already heard uh, something in the uh, introductory presentation about Clarin, so I will skip about uh, what the acronym stands for. Um, let's go to an example. Uh, language is providing uh, Clarin is providing uh, access to language resources. Um, and uh, well actually I, I found this example in preparation of the RDA meeting in Tokyo, Japan, but I think it's a very good um, illustration of how language resources are more than just uh, linguistics, uh, more than just the language data by itself. Uh, as you can see here, there's an example of um, a, a book uh, from uh, Japan which describes the tsunami of 1707. Um, and uh, well, it's, it has different um, dimensions that it adds to the just the pure language material. So, uh, well, first of all, it's been written down in specific uh, transcript. It needed some human interpretation. As you can see uh, over here, it also needed some uh, annotations since there are kind of different words which basically uh, conceive the meaning of tsunami. So it could be uh, uh, waves in the harbor or uh, a high tide in the evening, things like that. So it also it, it, it is about combining information and adding uh, human annotations on top of the purely um, linguistic material. Well, just as an illustration, there's some more information um, over here, including a link to the very interesting article which describes the whole um, uh, well, kind of search in how to uh, decipher this information, how to connect it to also uh, other uh, fields than just linguistics. So this is kind of information that ties into uh, historians. Uh, it is uh, uh, obviously telling something about the way people were living that time in Japan, so uh, ethnography. But it, it even connects in this case uh, to uh, um, uh, geology and things like that. So it's a very multidisciplinary uh, approach which you can derive from that language material. Good, how does uh, Clarin um, try to give access to this kind of language data. Well, it's a distributed architecture. So as you can see here, Clarin exists of different centers spread all over the world, mostly currently in Europe, but we're extending. Uh, and it's giving access to uh, yeah, language data through HTTP, so the internet protocol, um, through web applications and web services. Everything is distributed, so that means that you as a user here in the UK can also make use of a repository uh, in Germany, Finland, or a web service in Greece. Um, we call the nodes in this network centers, and I'll give you a bit more details about that later on. Um, this is a bit of organizational details. I think this was also already mentioned tomorrow, uh, this morning during the introductory presentation, so I will uh, skip on that. So what's the advantages of um, being part of Clarin? Well, it's about having access to the Clarin infrastructure and I will run you through the services which we are offering in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, it's about having access to the expertise through what we call the Clarin knowledge sharing infrastructure. So it is really having uh, a specialist about, uh, let's say, how to uh, store uh, sound recordings in a sustainable way and making sure that they can be reused later on, but also about uh, specialists in, in tree banks, things like that. So it's really kind of networking all this information and making that easily accessible to the research community. It's also, it's also about um, embedding um, the uh, humanities research community and making sure that data can be used, can be reused. We just saw some very interesting um, uh, perspectives on that, on how a single um, interview, for instance, can be a purpose towards different research questions or the other way around. Um, and of course, it's also about uh, the visibility uh, of the language and the cultural heritage. So if you have data uh, about such, um, such cultural, cultural heritage <coughs> material, it's very good to be able to share it and to reuse it. And uh, well, there are some opportunities, obviously, for uh, cross-lingual and cross-cultural research, but also uh, to participate in, in research projects which can um, basically uh, make use of this. 
Good. Uh, quick map. There are currently 33 clearance centers. Um, as I said, mostly spread over Europe. There's one in the US also. This is extending all the time. If you're interested in getting some more information about these centers, you can have a look at the Clarin Eric website. We have a kind of categorization where a Clarin center can start uh, very basic, eh, providing just some, some, some know-how or uh, just some metadata and can grow into its ambitions and into to it, uh, its compliance with Clarin standards and requirements and as such, uh, uh, being even more integrated in the Clarin infrastructure. Good, then we come to some of the services which we are uh, providing. And I think this is really the core of what I would like to um, tell you today about what Clarin is about. Um, for a summary, you can always go to the website, uh, clarin.eu slash services, and you will find um, a bit of mere, more background on these, on these services. Uh, but I would like to stress that these are, these are really concrete and usable services. They, they do exist today. It's nothing that we intend to develop in the future. These services are available today. First of all, there is uh, depositing and archiving. So in these uh, 30 plus centers, uh, there is the uh, possibility to deposit your data in a way that they are compliant with the Clarin uh, requirements. That means that uh, you can provide Clarin compliant metadata, they will get persistent identifiers for easy citation, they will be integrated, uh, for instance, with uh, content search mechanisms, um, the metadata will be made searchable through the Clarin infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they get a kind of long-term perspective and also that deep integration into the, the technical uh, infrastructure. There's the Virtual Language Observatory, which is a um, kind of search portal for metadata descriptions. Uh, basically, what we do is we uh, harvest the metadata from those clearance centers and actually also from more centers around. We index it and make it searchable. And right now we have about 800,000 metadata records. Of course, there's a lot, so that also means that you need some very um, yeah, good searching mechanisms, uh, for instance, a facet search to narrow down the search space and to find really the important and relevant information. I just did uh, an example query uh, yesterday on interviews in the virtual language observatory. And as you can see here, there are about, what is it, 27, uh, thousand records which contain uh, in one way or the other way the word interviews. Of course that doesn't mean uh, that now you have a kind of complete overview of what is out there but it, it allows you now through this, the use of facets to narrow down uh, for instance uh, to a specific collection, uh, a specific collection which could, be uh, which could be relevant to your research question or uh, for instance by language uh, or by the uh, resource type. So is, let's say you really want to have an audio uh, file from an interview, then you can specify that. Just to give a kind of illustration of how to use these metadata records to find more detailed information. Good, uh, we also have the uh, federated content search that ties in a bit to the uh, theme that has been uh, talked about uh, earlier this morning. In fact, that you probably don't uh, only want to search through the metadata, but that you also want to, for instance, search through the transcripts of the interviews and try to really find, for instance, specific keywords. Through the federated content search, this is also possible. It's a kind of federated approach where you have one uh, search portal, and if you enter a query there, there is a contact made to different search databases over um, which are spread over the Clarin network and the query is performed there and the answers are sent back to this kind of central overview uh, 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 yeah, uh, mechanism. There's a, a screenshot of the federated content search here. Um, now interesting or good to, to uh, remember in this context is the fact that we don't aim at um, being a surrogate for those local search engines. No, it's rather being able to um, de detect where the interesting data is and then jump to the local search engine which might uh, give you much more um, search possibilities. Uh, say for instance the linkage with the video material or sound material uh, since of course that's the, the, the real uh, power horse you would like to use as a researcher. But this is a kind of first step trying to identify in which collections there could be something interesting uh, pertaining to your research questions. There are lots of web services and web applications also um, available. Um, 
And uh, again, there's, there's, there's a, a preliminary list on the website there, uh, but it go is both about those um, natural language processing tools, which could allow you to, for instance, create um, transcriptions more easily by uh, uh, speech recognition, for instance, or phonetic alignment, uh, part of speech tagging, uh, etc. Uh, but it could also be a bit more um, serving in, 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 in terms towards the, the distance reading. Eh? So uh, putting a large amount of data into a web application or web tool and then trying to find out the, the big patterns which are coming out of that. We try also to provide easy access to protected resources. I mean, it also has been mentioned quite a few times already that uh, especially in, in case of, of uh, sound recordings or personal information, it's not always possible to provide or to access the information uh, through uh, open access on, on a website. So therefore, there is um, what we call a federated login, uh, which allows uh, uh, researchers to use their institutional credentials, and so the login name and the username of the university, for instance, to access remote data. So uh, say you're interested in a specific uh, interview which is accessible for the academic community, but not um, really uh, open access, so you need to log in, then you just can go through that website use this kind of single sign-on and access the data which is available uh, over there. This should help a lot in um, um, lowering the hurdle to get access to such protected data sources. And also the other way around, also to make it possible for uh, data depositors to share their data more easily with the academic community. There are the virtual collections. Um, this is a kind of digital bookmark system by which uh, you are allowed uh, to create um, a kind of, of, uh, yeah, of bookmark set, uh, which then later on, so for instance, containing references to specific parts of interviews, um, and then uh, later on you can cite this with a persistent identifier, so with a link which will remain in place over a longer period. The metadata of this virtual collection, so what is it, what is it about, will also be indexed, will be made searchable through the VLO. And uh, we're also currently working on making this kind of collections machine processable. So say you have links to different uh, WAV files or to different text files, then it will be possible to use such a virtual collection send it to uh, what we call uh, a language resource switchboard and then process that data automatically based on the input of what you have gathered in a virtual collection. Um, good, ah, I think this is a slide which uh, didn't work so I will skip on it. Uh, and there is uh, finally also consultancy, very important part of course, I already mentioned it. If you have a question, if you're wondering about how to integrate things into Clarin, if you're wondering how Clarin could help you with your specific research question or if you would like to set up a kind of collaboration with colleagues which could tie in with this concept, then uh, Clarin is very glad to, to help you and give some uh, um, yeah, information about this. Good, um, quick uh, run up of the technological pillars and I won't bore you too much with the details. Um, first of all, the federated identity, so logging in with your own credentials. Secondly, persistent identifiers through handles. Uh, uh, so basically making sure that whatever you cite is also accessible tomorrow and also in a longer period of time. So say five, 10 years and that it's, uh, st it can be cited in a standard way. Same goes for fragments of uh, language resources. So if you say I want to highlight that specific sentence in a transcript or in a sound recording, it's possible with these persistent identifiers. Um, thirdly, sustainable repositories. These, uh, yeah, these repositories which, which make up the kind of the core of Clarin eh, through this federated setup, um, where if you are storing your resources, they will also be uh, safe on a longer uh, period of time. Um, we're making use of uh, flexible metadata and con concept definitions, basically um, allowing some flexibility since we realize that um, for specific purposes you might need different metadata descriptions, but at the same time making sure that there are also links to clear definitions so that, um, yeah, that it's clear what you're talking about and that there can be a kind of semantic harmonization. Um, and then finally, uh, well-described and open protocols, um, as I said, we, we have a clear protocol, for instance, for this uh, federated content search, where we have a full description of how to tie into this, where we're also trying to provide libraries to connect to such um, a search uh, tool. 
And similarly, uh, also the, uh, the, the web services uh, uh, can be, can be uh, used in such an open way. So it is all a matter of, of being, uh, yeah, providing clear documentation and providing information about these protocols. Good. Um, yeah, it's not only um, about uh, just these pillars. I think important within the Clarin framework is the integration. First part there is integration within Clarin, making sure that those centers are not islands, but are really collaborating, can uh, exchange information, and can reuse uh, some of the uh, technology provided through the other centers. Um, so, um, yeah, and to give uh, some concrete examples in the context of this workshop there, so uh, later on this afternoon I think there will be a presentation given about Elan, which is often used to create annotations for, for instance, uh, audiovisual data. Uh, Elan has been integrated with uh, two web services, uh, one of them uh, Weblicht, uh, which allows you to do automatic uh, part of speech tagging, for instance, of the sentences that you have entered, so that it saves you some time in t in when you're creating the annotations. And um, secondly, also with WebMouse, which is a service from uh, the Clarion Center uh, at, uh, in, in Munich, uh, the Bayerische Archiv für Sprachsignale, which allows you to do automatic phonetic alignment. So if you have an audio signal, you have a transcript, orthographic transcript of what has been said, uh, web, this WebMouse connection will uh, allow a kind of automatic alignment of that. Uh, so first of all, a um, uh, phoneme, uh, grapheme, uh, grapheme phoneme, um, um, uh, conversion, and then secondly also making sure there is an automatic alignment uh, with the, the timeline. So it should be able to sa uh, save you a lot of time. Um, and this kind of things will also be more closely integrated through the language resource switchboard. Um, given the restrictions of time, I will uh, skip that for now. Uh, secondly, important part, oh, and that's a pity, uh, well, there's a nice diagram missing here uh, indicating how Clarin integrates not only within Clarin itself, but also with the outer world, so the infrastructure world. Think about uh, infrastructural layers like uh, Géant eh, to, to make sure the networking level is, is working uh, with EUDET for uh, large uh, uh, data set uh, storage and safe replication. Uh, with um, colleagues uh, from Daria, with uh, a research infrastructure, um, uh, yeah, uh, fora like the Research Data Alliance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And finally, of course, also with the, the researchers uh, themselves. And I think that's that's where we are uh, here for at this workshop, trying to gather some information and trying to exchange ideas about how um, how Clarin tools and data can be used for research, but also the other way around. What kind of questions come from your site and how, how Clarin can uh, do something about that. Um, so, yeah, what, what I would like to stress uh, in, in that respect is that Clarin is not something very static. I mean, it is a dynamic in research infrastructure, and while we have uh, this kind of fe uh, uh, fe federation of archives and services, it, um, it, it is a kind of constantly evolving uh, infrastructure. So that means that it, for us it's very important to uh, listen to your needs, to learn from your experiences, and I think there already has come by a lot of information this morning, so I'm very glad. <coughs> I made a lot of notes, and uh, I think that will be uh, gratefully used in the next uh, planning phases for Claren. Um, and uh, also to create <coughs> additional bridges, eh? so between the research infrastructures on the one hand, and on the other hand, potential users and data and service providers. Uh, very concretely, and maybe this is already a bit too much into detail, but I thought it would be good to give some feedback to the, uh, the database which was being distributed about the oral uh, uh, data collections. Um, I thought that it would be very nice if it would, in the end, be possible to integrate that into the virtual language observatory, so that if a researcher is searching for, I don't know, a specific collection from uh, this or that country, that it can be found through um, the VLO. Uh, challenging there, of course, is, is gathering uh, comparable metadata from the different sources. It's always very difficult, especially if there's so many different uh, countries and initiatives. Uh, but I think this is a very first good step at trying to define the fields which are necessary. Um, and uh, yeah, technically, that, that could be done uh, through uh, either a Dublin Core over OAI, OAI PMH, or through specific uh, metadata profiles. Um, 
inter interesting question there is what to do with the non-digitized resources. So on the one hand, of course, it's also always very important to know that these resources exist. On the other hand, what we often have experienced is that uh, researchers who are searching for something and they find that something doesn't exist in digital form yet, uh, th there, th this increases the kind of frustration level and it's, it, it's, it, there's a kind of balance to find there um, and uh, I think a key there is at least providing contact information in terms uh, when there is something interesting, making sure that there is a person to contact or an organization which can react on queries to get access to the original uh, data, even if it's not yet digitized yet. Uh, what to do with access restrictions? Um, it's of course Again, very important to provide detailed information about how to access specific uh, resources. Um, there, there are some standards for that and I was very glad to see that we have a kind of three layer classification which is very much in line uh, with uh, uh, what was presented earlier during the UK data services uh, presentation. So there's some possibilities to, sta to standardize or trying to harmonize on that field I think. And providing single sign-on so that if you need to log in it's convenient to do it and it's not really um, uh, an extra hurdle to get to the data. Um, well, there are some, some nice portals uh, like this uh, Verteld Verleden uh, site which, which have a kind of starting point for that. Um, and secondly, I thought it was also be interesting to maybe have a look at how we could connect these kind of transcript search engines to the federated content search. So that you have one portal where you can search all of them and uh, if you're then interested and, and want to find out more details that you can jump to the original search engine and uh, have a look in all depth on the original data. Good, um, so, so far for my uh, yeah, quick feedback round, uh, but I think uh, most important in, in, in this context is uh, to gather your ideas, your suggestions and your feedback. And um, well, concluding uh, with these words, I'm looking very much forward to the discussions this afternoon and tomorrow, where I hope we will have possibility for this kind of uh, information exchange. So thank you very much.